session. So I think that's all my housekeeping roles. Once again, I am so happy that everyone is here and joining us. And I, uh, without further ado, would like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, he is a longtime Soldovia resident. He is a fisherman. He is an active Soldovia oil spill response member. He is Walt Sonin, and here he is. Thanks, Rose. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Walt Sonin. I'm the current president of the uh, Soldovia oil spill response team. And uh, the reason this event has occurred was that uh, here uh, just about a month and a half ago, we had our annual Soldovia oil spill response team um, annual potluck, and it was not very well attended. And uh, so several of us decided that we might rev things up a little bit if here on the anniversary of the Exxon Valdez oil spill that, that we might get together with members of the community and talk about what happened and, and uh, what occurred and what went through our minds. And uh, it worked out such that the crew here at the library picked up on it and decided that we should go statewide with this thing. And so here we are. Um, and our thoughts were that probably half of the people here in Soldovia weren't alive or were too young or didn't live here 25 years ago. And uh, so um, we, we thought that this might be a proper event for tonight. And I've been very surprised and encouraged by the amount of media coverage here in the last several weeks. Um, I Almost every day something comes on the radio or has been in the, the papers, both local and the Anchorage papers, about the spill. And um, so it has it's sort of been my concern that... Uh, that there has been a growing indifference uh, that most people have fallen into concerning the spill and that uh, that we need to remember um, ab about it with respect to the safety of oil operations here in Cook Inlet and elsewhere around the state. So, 25 years ago today, shortly after midnight, the Exxon Valdez hit Bly Reef, and the resulting spill was 11 million gallons, and, and some argue that that may have been two to three times that much. Spilled into Prince William Sound. It was flat calm for three days. Nothing, virtually nothing was done in terms of uh, cleaning up that oil spill. And uh, shortly after that, there was a storm that I understand recorded uh, winds up to 70 knots and dispersed the spill. <coughs> and we, we lost our opportunity at that point to make an effective cleanup of any kind whatsoever. And it covered, I understand, 11,000 square miles of water eventually and uh, 1,300 miles, linear miles of beach. And I could guess we could go on and on about that, but I'm sure most people are somewhat familiar with the, with the resulting damage. The financial and environmental costs have been talked about quite a bit um, about the spill. The social and emotional costs and disruption are not talked about so much. But for many of us who live in the spill zone, the social and emotional effects are very much a part of our memories. The only thing in my life that has affected me as much as the spill was a tour of duty in Vietnam in 1965 as a young Marine. It was indeed a watershed 
the spill was indeed a watershed event for many of us. So I would like to invite discussion, comments, questions, show and tell, what have you, uh, from all of you in this room and those of us online here so that, that we can um, celebrate this event by remembering. And but before we move on to that phase, um, we have here uh, Tim Robertson, and he was the fellow who brainstormed and came up with the idea for this organization that we have had running here in town ever since, um, which is the Seldovia Oil Spill Response Team. We call it the SOS Team, and it is unique in the state. Um, I guess I'll, I'll let Tim talk about it um, here, but uh, we, I guess, at the time had hoped that this oil spill response team would be replicated throughout the um, throughout the state, but it didn't get very far. Tim. <clears throat> Well, uh, thank everyone for uh, showing up tonight and, uh, and joining us uh, in this 25th uh, remembrance of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Uh, Walt gave me a list of the uh, communities that are online. And I, I uh, thought that we would kind of start out with, uh, you know, who's here and what their involvement was and, uh, and what they know about the spill a little bit. So uh, we've got 22 people present here in Soldovia and... Um, Maybe we could just get a show of hands of everyone who wasn't born in 1989. So everyone here in Soldovia was born uh, uh, before 1989, and, and that says something about our audience tonight and, and the, the <laughs> lack of younger folks that, uh, that are, aren't, aren't here, um, weren't around during the oil spill. Um, I guess uh, we'll... We'll go to uh, Valdez next, and uh, how many people are there? You, I see three. Can some, hold up fingers or let us know. I can't see. Or I, I can't see. But uh, if, if someone can talk, looks like three three people there. Anybody there that was not born in 1989? Three. Three. Okay. How uh, is anybody there that wasn't is, is younger than uh, was born after 1989? No. Well, okay. Uh, how how about uh, Kotzebue? We got is two people from Kotzebue. Is that correct? Yep, two people from Kotzebue, and we were both around. She was 11, and I was 28. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was 11 years old, and that time, tell you the truth, I really didn't care. But, well, thank you. Thank you. So I'm happy I'm here. Yeah. How about Barrel? Uh, three people in Barrel, is that correct? Any any youngsters there? Zero. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Craig? I was 24, and it's kind of <laughs> unnerving that I remember the oil spill, even though I wasn't in Alaska at the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anchorage, anyone there? Hi, we just have one right now, but uh, our presentation in the other room is breaking up, so we're expecting more. Okay. But yes, and I was, uh, did, I, did I miss any communities? Uh, go ahead, Anchorage. Um, so, it, to me, that's kind of a, you know, an indicator that mostly people that were alive in 1989 are interested in uh, what we have to say tonight. Um, here in Soldovia, how many people were actually involved in the spill response in some way, whether you're, you were officially involved or, or so, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
That is just a fish for me. Yeah. So we have about seven out of our 22, about a third of the people here were some way actually involved in the spill response. And uh, Valdez? Say it again. Juan. Juan. Um, how about, uh, no one in Kotzebue, I think you already spoke to that, and, and Craig as well. Anyone in Barrow? So, uh, not, not many people actually have um, hands-on experience with the oil spill, less than half of us, if you will. So, and that, that really kind of surprises me because the Exxon Valdez was such a turning point in my life. It's so much has defined me as a human being since then that I think everybody has that common experience. And uh, I think part of what we w need to do 25 years after that, uh, that experience for those of us that were involved in it is to share it a little bit and uh, to pass that along. Um, I guess there's some kind of saying about folks that uh, don't remember the mistakes that are made or doomed to repeat them or something like that. And so, uh, you know, to be honest with you, it's not a topic that I really enjoy discussing. It's not something I have a, a lot of, uh, of coming to anniversaries and talking about, but after 25 years, I think it's, a, it, it's time to do that. So um, I'll start out with just a little bit of my memories, and I hope to jog the memories of other people that uh, were involved. I hope you all will speak in some way tonight. Um, for those of you that weren't involved, I, I hope you will uh, give us your impressions of it, of what, uh, as, as you've gone through your walk in life about what your, your impressions are of the spill. It was no big deal. It was a great big deal. Uh, it's something that um, uh, is important to me or, or not, not so much. So, uh, so starting with my story, I uh, came to Seldovia because I love coastal Alaska. I always growing up thought if I could find a place that there were mountains and the oceans at the same place, that's where I wanted to be. And, and Seldovia is that for me. It's, it's the most beautiful place in the world for me. And uh, I love being here. I, I, I love the coast. The reason I came to town was to build a lodge up the head of Soldovia Bay. We were going to do ecotourism, take people out and show, show them the coast, kayak, uh, beach walk, uh, take people fishing, uh, and, and share with, uh, with them the, the place that we love. Um, I was able to do that because I worked in the oil field. I uh, started my career as a fishery biologist, but then after a few years, I I went to work uh, in the oil field on the North Slope and worked in Cook Inlet. Uh, I drilled wells. I produced oil. And uh, so I, I was physically active as part of the oil production system for about 10 years of my life. And that's what afforded me the money to come and, and to build this lodge. So on March 24th, 25 years ago, uh, we woke up and heard that there had been an oil spill in Prince William Sound, and uh, the gravity of that didn't really sink in for a few days. Um, but a after a day or two, uh, someone came over from Cordova and, and, and basically said to us that, you know, this thing is big and it's getting worse, and if uh, you guys are going to do anything about protecting your resources, you, you need to get off your duffs and do that yourself because Exxon's not doing nothing, the Coast Guard's not doing anything, uh, you know, it, it's it's it, it's going to be us taking care of ourselves from this from this point on. And so that that kind of woke everybody up. Uh, I was new in town at the time, so a lot of the people here I really didn't know that well. Um, we came to a meeting uh, in that room right over there, the multi-purpose room, and uh, the whole town pretty much was there to hear hear what was going on. The fire chief at the time was Frank Monty, and uh, he had put these signs up around the room. Um, operations, logistics, finance. Um, we didn't know what that was. That, that was the first time I was ever introduced to the incident command system, which is a big part of my life uh, today and, and what I do. And we as a community came together, like, uh, you know, a very miraculous thing uh, for me. Uh, like I said, I didn't know a lot of people in town at that point. Uh, it, it was essentially everyone dropped everything. Uh, what, whatever was going on became a lesser priority than the community getting together and uh, protecting uh, our resources from oil spills. Um, at that time, a lot, uh, as, as, of today, as, as it is today, almost everybody uh, in town had something to do with the water. Uh, you know, we were fishermen, we were uh, 
tourist operators. We were cannery workers. We uh, all all of us lived uh, on the water. So uh, the the water was an important resource to us. And so we came together as a community, and, and we worked miracles. I mean, really, literally miracles. Uh, uh, somewhere around 6,000 feet of oil boom was produced right here in this harbor by the people in this town. Uh, we uh, took uh, fish, fish pumps and made skimming systems out of it. We invented oil spill response from zero. Uh, we got no help from the outside because the whole entire world was going to Prince William Sound to fight this oil spill. And nobody was thinking about the fact that it was going to come out of Prince William Sound, come around the corner and impact us. But that's exactly what happened. About 11 days after the oil spill, uh, we, the oil came out of Prince William Sound. It came down the Kenai Peninsula and pretty much killed everything in its path. Um, and by that time, we had developed boom. We had boom across the, the slough. We had boom out at... Uh, out at Elephant Rock, uh, we had, you know, done our best to do our defenses here, and 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 we were working great as a team. I mean, it was a, it, like I said, it was uh, there was no one really in charge. Frank Monsey was the fire chief, and he organized us according to the incident command system. We got together every day. We decided what our priorities were. We made a plan, and we went out and executed that plan, which is exactly what the incident command system is supposed to do. And so one day, someone came in and said, "We need to go meet the oil." Uh, we can't wait on it to come to us. So we uh, put together skimming systems and boom that we've made ourselves. And we essentially had every able-bodied man and boat in the harbor. And we left here and we went down. We stopped in Port Graham. We invited them to come join us. And uh, a number of their uh, folks came along as well. And we went down. We went around Point Adams. And, and that's when the gravity of it really hit me for the first time of what this really was. Um, I know you've all... Uh, everyone on uh, around the state tonight lives on the coast, and I know you know what it's like to be out on the water and on the beaches, and um, and to come around that corner at Point Adams and see what we saw. It was just devastating. I mean, there was no sound. Normally, you've got birds and animals and squawking and making noise, and and there was nothing. There were no birds flying, and there was. Oil on the water. There was, uh, and when I say oil, I'm not talking like a slick of oil like you see on the um, on the pictures. It was uh, more like grease mixed with uh, 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 seaweed and uh, birds and otters, and you know, it was just it was gross. It was really bad. But uh, the amazing thing was again that uh, the response of the people that. Uh, were here that lived on this coast and and uh, depended on it, and we did our best. We really did. We uh, we worked as a group, as a community. Um, I saw people that uh, were, uh, you know, mortal em enemies in the fishing industry. Uh, you know, working to de together side by side. I saw guys that would, you know, knock you flat in the bar at the drop of a hat, standing on the beach, crying their eyeballs out at what they saw. Uh, these are the things that I remember, and, and they, they had a big effect on me and, and on my life. And, um, and I appreciate you listening to me, and I'm, uh, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Rose. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, it's sometimes hard to hear about that without it tears welling, um, but thank you for your story. So at this point, I would like to start with the audience in Soldovia to um, ask you to share your stories. Um, let me see if there are any takers. Okay, come on up. I'd like to introduce Mr. Craig Higman, please. All I know is the Exxon Valdez became the Exxon Mediterranean, and as we speak, they're finally cutting the last piece of steel out of that in India, and it's going to make rebar. <laughs> Thank you very much, Higgy. And, um, okay, Walter McInnes, come on up. Hi there. I'm Walter McKinnis. I came here in 1960. 
And I was here when the oil spill situation happened and know many of the participants, including my own family. A mention was made of social and emotional. And I, I know you can certainly pick up from what Mr. Robertson and from Walter Sonnen said that it was very emotional. And community-wise, everybody responded. And a couple of days ago, I seen a Homer newspaper where it showed some people uh, remembering this event. And uh, one of the signs that was held up from one of the places in one, I can't remember, it's Halb Cove or here, that said, you're not going to stop us. I'm going to say that again. You are not going to stop us. And it referred to the government and to the Coast Guard because people were not going to be held back from protecting their own. And by their own, I mean their jobs, their community, their ocean, their food, their life. I seen a couple of friends sit down have a couple of drinks after a week or two and one turned to the other and more or less said you're a traitor a lot of people from here including my daughter worked on that oil spill the deal was the person who said you're a traitor was crying and they were crying because that's how emotional and how upset they were by the oil spill and what it was doing to their lives. What it did to my life, I, uh, the mayor at the time was Jerry Willer, and he responded strongly. I wanted to go, but he said, Walter, you cover me with the electric company and I'll pay you back later. So I didn't go. My oldest daughter went with Mr. Robertson and what Mr. Robertson did not mention, and I certainly will, because it goes along with what I said about, hey, we're going. Who do we rely on most? Who do we respect the most? Who do we get the most from? At a time like this, our neighbors. That's where it come from. Not from the Coast Guard, Pardon me, they did their own thing. Certainly not from the oil companies. And when Mr. Robertson left here to go and fight the oil with volunteer people, they were signed up with an outfit that was supposed to be paying them. And they got part way down and that outfit called them from Homer Spit and told them to come back. And here's where my pride comes in for this community and anybody who went down there, including my daughter. They said, we're not coming back. We're going to fight the oil. And that's what happened in this whole area. Everybody had the guts, the courage, the stamina to stand up. The school kids were organized and were part of their school. They came down and built booms on the beaches. The booms were made of whatever material that could be gotten. And I did see this in the Homer News where they showed a couple of the other bays up, up the bay a ways where they did the same thing. They just picked up everything they had and tied it together to make a boom. There, I don't know, I would say we're fortunate in so much we have a memory and that we know what this oil spill was. We know enough not to forget it. Not, we know enough not to let somebody say, oh, that's all in the past, or, oh, uh, you know, forget, uh, forget that stuff that we need. We need to have more boats or less boats, or we need less tugs, or we need less environmental coverage. We need to remember and we need to pay attention. And right there, Sarah Baxter, she's been on top of this situation since the beginning. She has fish sites. 
on McDonald's bit for since before I come here. And she's been involved with the Saldovia oil spill organization all the way. And the people who are involved with it are very strongly committed. And that's in my comments. You all have, I hope you remember. All right. Thank you, Walter. And um, as a side note, he's my dad. <laughs> I'm not the oldest daughter, though. Um, and I see uh, he just uh, spoke of Sarah Baxter. She is ready to talk. Come on up, Sarah. I'm Sarah Baxter. I've been fishing in Kachemak Bay since 1962. Uh, right after the oil spill, my husband and I and the other two kids were living in Bethel. <clears throat> I got a phone call from Link. She said, get down here, Mom. They need you. Um, so I did. Sorry. Well, I started out building Harbor Boom, and uh, we did that for several days. And then I left with the fleet with uh, Tim and the rest of the fishing boats. I was the only skiff-powered responder at that point, also the only woman, which made things interesting. Uh, and as uh, Walter said, uh, we were ordered to return, and we got together, and we said... Uh, we're going, and we'll stay as long as we have food and gas, and we did. And uh, we uh, har uh, went down to Port Graham, and uh, some of the food was potato chips. Uh, I don't know quite how that came about, but uh, they uh, provided us with some gloves, all of which came in one size, large. I'm not. Uh, and uh, so when I got back home, I took some of my fishing gloves and uh, those knit picking gloves, and uh, I used those. At the time, I had a sort of a naive notion that um, skin was something like a raincoat, you know, and it would shed everything. Well, it doesn't. And I wound up getting uh, sick for about a week because my hands were soaked in oil all day for a week. Um, and uh, Tim kept trying to get me to go back and uh, back and see Doc, and I didn't want to go because I knew it was going to be rough, and I was going to get seasick on top of being sick already. And I finally uh, decided I better go before he chased me out. And uh, then we, uh, I got back down there and I spent most of my time driving a skiff, fishing for oil patties, and uh, what worked the best there was a. Uh, a little handmade frame on the end of a pole and you just scoop it up and flip the oil into the tote in the skiff. And uh, we were talking about, oh, the uh, Walter was talking about the, I consider misbehavior of the industry and the government agencies. We were working on Elizabeth Island and uh, the park service decreed that we had to rake out our tracks before we could leave at the end of the day. They were so worried about us contaminating a beach where I counted 17, I picked up 17 dead murs that were so covered with oil that you could see nothing but it was just a lump and after a while you learned, well that's the right size of a lump, that's a bird. I, we uh, forget who it was, I think maybe it was Carl Pulliam, uh, came by and asked me, uh, you know, what can you use? What can, I, can, what can we do for you? I said, get us two four-wheelers and trailers so we can haul this stuff up to the dump. There's a, a temporary dump made for the plastic bags we were putting the oil in. And uh, we were having to carry them up there. I said, well, give us a couple four-wheelers. They got us one, I'm sure. They were down to their last dollar to do that. Uh, but uh, that made it a lot more efficient. So instead of 
dragging those plastic bags up the beach, we could get another empty one and fill it. And uh, then uh, we were, I was uh, bunking on the, on the Fasilov, uh, which uh, was the supply barge. Uh, it was, uh, I think, the only vessel in the fleet that had a spare stateroom, so I got a room all to myself. Uh, it was about four feet wide. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> one night we got a, a new person on the crew. He'd come down from Anchorage, and he was... Uh, They'd hired one too many people. There weren't quite enough bunks. So he wound up bunking on the floor in the galley, which wasn't that big a deal, except he snored. He was terrible. And I, my door was shut, and I wrapped a, claw, a towel around my head. I couldn't go to sleep. Um, and uh, then I remembered that the barge captain had a couple of pairs of Mickey Mouse ears hanging on the wall just outside the door. Because every time he went down to check on the engines, he put on these Mickey Mouse ears. And I thought, I'll wake up in time, and I'll get those back before Lee gets up. I didn't. <laughs> so I snuck one, his best pair, of course, because they were on top. And I got those on, and then I had to wrap a towel around my head in order to muffle that <laughs> well enough to go to sleep, as tired as I was. And uh, next morning, I was wakened up by sounds of indignation, and uh, oh my gosh. So I grabbed the Mickey Mouse ears off my head and stuck my arm out the door and said, were you looking for these? And... Uh, Lee just kind of looked at me like, I could do without this. And this fellow, I would have to tell you, not only did he snore, but he was oblivious. And there'd been a lot of joking and the night before, and he goes, ha, 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 first joke of the day. I said, no, I couldn't sleep last night. And uh, everything got real quiet, and they found another bunk for him someplace else. Um, my impressions of the spill, of course, what really made an impress, uh, what really got my attention was the indifference of the industry and the incompetence and infighting by various government entities. Uh, the Elizabeth Island incident just really uh, is a real good example of that, where. Um, one one agency was more interested in tracks than it was in in really getting the job done. And uh, well, the difference it's made in my life has been to be more uh, certainly been alert to environmental hazards ever since then, and and uh, an abiding interest in emergency preparedness. And I think we all need to think about that, not only in terms of oil spills. Lots of things can happen out there that we need to deal with. But if we just have our heads kind of tracking in that direction, um, we get a jump on it. Thanks. Thank you. That was Sarah Baxter. And let me scan the audience here in Soldovia to see if there are other people that would like to speak. Is there anyone that can remember the school and what they did? Would you Besides speak me? Go <laughs> ahead. Um, I, I, any, yeah, let the audience. I know that I see one, two, three of the people that I went to school with, who four, and four, if you count staff for uh, a helper, that would have been there at the time. And one thing that happened here in Soldovia is, uh, I think it was previously mentioned, but our whole community came together. They shut our school down for three days. And for three days, every single child that was enrolled in the school was given a job to do. 
Most of us helped to build booms. We went out to a big, long beach, which is about a mile out of town here, and we lined the parts up all along the beach. There were little, little kids working on it all the way up to, I was a senior in high school at the time. We were given um, jobs like rolling out the plastic. Some of us got to take pictures. Some of us got to collect up the parts. Um, and uh, I think as a school child, it was, really interesting um, a memory that I have is going into that command center that Tim um, described. It's a room just across the hall here. And it felt like, not knowing much because I was just a young girl, but it felt like walking into a black room. Now, mind you, there are windows all around this room with light going in. But you went into the, the room and the immediate mood, the immediate feeling that you got was this curtain of blackness, this heavy veiled sense of the, the magnitude of the situation. So that's my memory. Um, I did bring an item and we're gonna see if, <laughs> it's, a, it's a small little item, but uh, we went beachcombing a lot. And here is a rock with Exxon oil on it. Ta-da! Uh, can you see that? See the other sites? That's been sitting on the shelf at our house for quite 25 years, actually. Um, so uh, these rocks, you could walk along our beach and, and pick them up. It, it wasn't the magnitude of oil that came around the corner, but it certainly did wash up to our own Soldovia Beach, and we found these rocks very regularly here. Um, so that was my show and tell. And Walt, did you want to share your shirt, or is there anything? <laughs> yeah, we, we we brought a couple of T-shirts. There were there were many T-shirts that were made, um, and very few survived. But uh, this... you want to show the back first, <laughs> and then the front. Uh, sure. <laughs> we'll give you these. Will give you some idea of the of the feeling that was. Um, throughout the community. This is the back of the t-shirt here. It was a dirty job and Exxon wouldn't do it. And uh, what did the ORT stand for? Oil spill response team. Oil response. Yeah. Did you draw that picture, Didi? The, <laughs> the, the artist of that picture is here tonight. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Yeah. And um, swirling around the room, that green book, if you could let that book make its way up here. Um, Tim mentioned that there were hundreds and hundreds of feet worth of oil booms constructed right here in Soldovia. We didn't want the oil to get into our harbor. I remember that much. And those booms went all the way around the harbor. I remember the day they pulled them out. But we do have a picture of it here. You want to do that first? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the top one? It's um, this one? This one? Oh, one, you can go one, two, three. Yeah. And if you'll just bear with us just one minute, she's going to get the switched over to the camera. Um, the first view will be uh, the school children of our community uh, with their teachers and community members working together to build oil booms on the beach. And the second view is going to be a close-up of what those booms look like. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, do you want to talk about this picture, Tim? Do you know much about this picture? No, other than that was the boom that we built in the harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this was the first, these were the first booms, yeah, the ones where we used pieces on. of wood. And then, but then we got the big, the big tubes of absorbent stuff, and we built lots and lots of boom out of that. It was like this was the first effort, and then the first kind effort of... effort was whatever we could find. Okay. We ended up parking them on Scooter Beach. We brought a boatload of logs over from the Homer Spit, and that's where we started. But we eventually yeah. went to more fishing gear. targets. Well, and, and in this one, when we first started with the kids, we were using the trimmings from logs and nailing them together and rolling them up at first. And then 
Just tell them what they mean. But anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, it, it developed. There was quite a team working on it. Should I do this t-shirt now? Yeah, we've got one more t-shirt to show you here. Just uh, a moment. And a warning, it's a bit risque. So uh, here here it comes. No, we, we, there's no one yawn in this. In this <laughs> we, we realize we have no one after 89, so we're OK. But here you go. An another t-shirt re reflecting the sentiment. Yeah, I'll give it a minute to. Uh, that shirt that can, if you can see. I, I don't know if you all can see that. It's a uh, <laughs> it's a picture of someone mooning somebody else, and it says Exxon, this butts for you. We have a bit of a glare there. Uh, That's what happens to your ring. You just sit down with that. Um. I'm hoping now to take a turn at some of the other sites. Um, we want Roy to talk. Tim says Roy gets to talk. We know that Roy is in Valdez. So Roy, uh, are you ready to share a story or two? Sure. Thank you. Um, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes. yes. OK, good. Um, I guess the, the couple stories, Tim kind of related to one of where everybody came together. I guess several people have done that. Uh, that, that was one of the things that's kind of been uh, stuck in my mind a lot because, you know, Sonovia is not that big and it was always kind of like a family and we had our in-laws that wouldn't talk to each other. But during the, uh, during that phase of the response, it, it was, it was really remarkable. And, and I, that stuck with me. Um, this, this spill uh, basically shaped most of my adult life, and then I kind of fell into a career coming out of that. Um, as we went down around the corner, uh, again, you know, we were just picking up uh, tar mats as they were coming up. One of the stories that I, I would relate is that uh, one of our Exxon supervisors, uh, one time on a beach down near uh, Picnic Harbor, we were picking up oil that was heavily oiled gravel, pea gravel, on this point, and we were having to build a uh, basically a ramp to get the, the oil out in bags and slide it down the ramp in which we had to get to a skip and then that had to get out to the barge that we were collecting the bags on. And I was explaining this to the Exxon supervisor that how hard this was going to be. And his response to me, and actually with some other people from our crew standing around, was that, you know, I don't see why we're going to all this effort. People live down in Galveston has oil flowed in all the time and it doesn't bother them. And, and I had to stop one of our crew members because I was just sure that it was going to take a swing at him. Uh, it, that was kind of the attitude we got uh, for a lot of this. Um, so, you know, in short, I, I'll, I'll stop with one thing. You know, I, 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 that, that was a traumatic time. Uh, you know, I had some good memories of that time as well, uh, just from the camaraderie that that was uh, part of that, that experience. Um, but, you know, it could happen again. We've got a very robust system here in Prince William Sound. There's a lot of oil spill gear that's in Prince William Sound. There's a lot in Cook Inlet. We're so far ahead of where we were in 89, but we just had an exercise in October that, that had field components to it and a big spill ended up being, you know, a theoretical spill of 500,000 barrels. And in 48 hours, we could not pick anything up because of the weather. Uh, the ceiling was down, the magic, you know, dispersants used that industry and the Coast Guard and, and a lot of others like to think that they're going to be able to use. We weren't able to, to fly, so that wouldn't have been able to be applied. And so that at the end of 48 hours, there was still no oil picked up. And if we have a big spill like that and the weather conditions happen to be such as they were in October and they're not that unusual, there's a chance we aren't going to be able to pick it up and this could happen all over again. So with that, that's that's kind of my two cents. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a little scary to think about that. Um, I think I'll go to the other sites now. And some of you may not have been here or been involved, but you may have questions. So um, I'll go to Craig. Um, and for my audience, Craig is uh, the library in the middle on the bottom. 
Uh, do either of you have a question or anything to add, Amy? Yeah, uh, I got to pass through you guys' country as a commercial fisherman before the spill. And it was pretty interesting. And then uh, after the spill, uh, <coughs> got involved with uh, spill response, just traveling around Alaska, looking at different. It was no oil boom. It was no containment. Now all the coastal communities have something in place. That's the worst thing I like to do is drag out an oil boom because that means there's a problem. And it's nothing compared to what happened up in you guys' part of the country. But when I first got up to Prince William Sound, there was a lot of sea otter, a lot of life. And uh, now we got the sea otter down here and we got our problems with the sea otter. But did your harbors ever come back? Your sound ever come back? It's my understanding you guys are still washing rocks every time somebody turns one over. And that's probably one of the southeast beaches where the weather just blew it up there. So writing's on the wall. It's going to happen again, maybe not here, maybe on the Oskosh Sea because they're drilling out there next to and no telling. It's happened all over the place and it's just greed. It's going to happen either oil or mining, it's going to choke us out. So that's my view, you know. I got my time on the water, I'm about ready to get off. But no place to go, you know. It's, what's the old saying? Don't shit where you eat. <laughs> Sorry, that's the way I look at it. I'm just being shy and bashful. That's my three cents. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I would. Uh, does anybody from SOS have anything they want to add or any comment to make about what he had to say? But do you still have Thanks for problems there? Do you still have problems there with with the oil? I mean, it is right below the surface on the beaches. I mean, at least that's what we all understand. So every now and again, does a storm come through and turn something over and? Oh my heck, there it is. More on Prince William Sound side than here. So one of the audience members, if you didn't hear her, she said it's more on the other side of the inlet from where we are, other side of the, uh, other side of the peninsula. Um, um, however, I will say that they're finishing up their conference there in, in Anchorage very soon, so we'll be able to maybe hear a little bit about that. Um, it, I, I, uh, comments, anyone? I thought the, the article in the Daily News today was really pretty good about what the lingering effects of the oil spill are. I think that's kind of the state of knowledge. Um, and rather than repeat that, I just refer people to, to, to that article that was published this morning. Okay. If you didn't hear, Tim is saying that the um, article published in the Anchorage Daily News this morning really um, – um, encompassed the effects of that, and then he's referring you to that article. It's this good article about that. Um, so moving on here, we are getting closer to our 8 o'clock time. Um, so we may be interrupted any minute to get Ricky Ott on and the folks at the Anchorage Library, but not quite yet. I, I want to go ahead and give Barrow a chance. Um, your room has been filling up throughout the evening, and I'm excited about that. Uh, do any of you there have any questions or anything you would like to add? What, what we realize here um, and, um, is that you may be facing um, very nearly soon, and if I say this wrong, I'll have the SOS team correct me, that, that uh, the opening of the Northwest Passage as shipping lanes and that the melting ice may soon affect uh, your communities there in Kotzebue and in Barrow, and that oil resistance Bill response on the water is going to become perhaps a very real uh, issue for you. Um, did I summarize that correctly? So uh, uh, with that said, we're, we're very happy that you had joined us and we uh, want to open the floor to you now in case you have any questions or comments or anything to add. And we'll go to Barrow now. Can you hear us okay, Barrow?
the other one is unfortunately not possible. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Could someone summarize a little bit about that article since we haven't seen that, what it said about the lingering effects? I did see on the internet that the herring didn't come back. But yeah, I think if they could summarize it. Sure. Can you hear me from here? This is this is yeah. Tim again. I, uh, basically, the state of knowledge on the impacts on, in Prince William Sound is there. There is still lingering oil there. There's oil right under the surface in some of the sheltered areas. Um, many of us have been there, turned over a rock or two, dug down a, a few inches, and there's sheen. Uh, it smells like oil. It, it, it acts like oil, and, and that oil in those few locations that it exists is still entering the ecosystem. So it's under the beach and the things that live in the beach uh, absorb it and the things that eat the things that live in the beach uh, are affected by it. Um, I think everyone knows that the, the herring population crashed in Prince William Sound about three years after uh, the Exxon Valdez and it's never come back. Um, it, it was the only herring population that crashed in the whole state uh, and it, it was coincidence with the, the oil. The herring, of course, were spawning at that, at that time of the year. Uh, and the larval herring are, are very, very uh, sensitive to, to oil spill impacts. And so that, that, uh, that part of the ecosystem went down and has never recovered. Uh, the uh, killer whale pop, there's two pods that live in Prince William Sound. Both of those pods uh, were uh, affected. And, uh, the biologists say that one pod may never one may never recover; that uh, they essentially are, are doomed to extinction. Um, the uh, things like harlequin ducks that I was talking about before that eat the things that are in the in the beach that is above the oil; uh, those populations haven't recovered. Um, there there are other impacts, and I'm sure there are other people that can speak to those impacts better than I can. I thought the Anchorage Daily News article did a pretty good job. There's also the Exxon Valdez uh, Trustee Council, whose job it is is to monitor the long-term uh, health of the uh, ecosystem. Uh, they have a lot of information on their side, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Tim. Uh, any other questions or comments from Barrow? And we will have time to come back to you later. Go ahead. I just had a question. Uh, I think I heard you say that the first three days the oil was just flowing into the sound and not a thing was done. Was Did I hear that right? And if so, was there some uh, discussion of how that happened? Uh, what I heard is it was too big to, they couldn't do anything about it. That's what it said on the radio. Okay. Actually, the, the oil spill equipment was, was buried in the snow in Valdez. Uh, this was an unimaginable event at that point in time. Uh, I, I guess the, the folks who were in charge of oil spill response thought that there would never be a need for that equipment. And uh, so there was equipment. It was buried in the snow. They had to dig it out. Uh, they weren't trained. They didn't have the, the, the uh, vessels to deploy it. Um, it, it very much was a situation. I think that everybody that's looked at it in retrospect would would say that we that we weren't prepared, that they weren't prepared, that they, they never imagined that this could could actually happen. So even though they had a contingency plan and they had some oil spill response equipment, this was never mobilized. Um, the fishermen from Cordova picked up more oil than Exxon in those three days, um, much more oil, and. Uh, and brought it into Valdez Harbor and gave it back to them. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Uh, Barrow, Thank do you have you. any other questions? I'd just like a, a small little vignette. I was living in Juneau in 1968, and our neighbor was working, was new. He was a researcher for Alaska Fish and Game, and he was supposed to do a write-up on the effects of this new pipeline that was going down to Valdez. So he did his write-up and he had predicted that there would be cataclysmic oil spills. And so they returned his research and told him to redo it. 
So that part of it would be cut out of the information. He left very uh, disenchanted. So it wasn't that the state didn't know. The state had been told. But they wanted to ignore the findings. You can't see it, but on this end in Soldovia, um, probably about 80% of the people were shaking their heads like this. Uh, they didn't like that, uh, as you can imagine. Um, well, that was 21 it, years before the spill. Uh, There's <laughs> never going to be an oil spill. <laughs> <laughs> so can you hear us in Anchorage? We can hear you. Are you all there and ready? We are. Can you see us? I guess that's the next question. <laughs> we can see you very clearly, and we are happy to have you join Thanks. us. If you're ready, um, am I speaking to Ricky? Uh, you are at the moment, yes. It's so nice to, to meet you, and thank you for joining us. Um, uh, may I introduce you, and would you like to join in and, and speak? I, I would love that, if it's appropriate right now. Absolutely, this is a great time. So ladies and gentlemen, from the Lusack Library in Anchorage, this is Dr. Ricky Ott. We do have uh, a recent uh, book that uh, she did called The Sound, Truth, and Corporate Myth, one of her books here at the library. Uh, she has just completed an event at the Lusack <laughs> Library that was sponsored by the RCAC, many of whom are probably in the room with her. So I would like you to please welcome um, Dr. Ricky Ott. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I guess, first off, I'd just like to say to um, Barrow and some of the other um, sites that um, I definitely uh, did a tour across the North Slope with uh, Rosemary Atungarook, um, Earl Kingett um, in, let's see, 2008 in January and in 2006 in December. Um, and at that time, I think I left copies of Sound Truth and Corporate Miss um, at the libraries, hoping that it would be useful to the school children and to the community should they ever have to deal with what we've had to deal with at the south end of the pipeline. Um, so that book is there. Um, and I don't have the benefit. I, I was at the RCAC event here in in Anchorage, so I'm not sure what all was shared, but um, I think I'd like to, if it's all right, just start with a little personal story and then kind of morph into what I see are the, the four big lessons from the Axon Valdez and kind of where things are at right now, where there's opportunities um, to strengthen oil spill prevention and response. Um, I, I will tell you, share right away that um, I don't think there's anything that be, can be done right now in broken sea ice and ice conditions. And um, there, this whole national contingency plan, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of the story, is uh, pretty much all smoke and mirrors. Um, really don't know how to clean up an oil spill. And sometimes I slip up and refer to oil spill response as cleanup, but I always bite my tongue afterward. Um, it's oil spill response. It's not a cleanup. There, it, forget the word cleanup. Um, but I, I do want to step back and say that um, I um, came up to Alaska. I, I would almost call it a random move. It was after I'd gotten my PhD from the University of Washington in, and, and a master's before that from the East Coast on oil pollution. And I, you know, it was pretty random choices um, that I made. And I finally, it was 1985, and I thought, well, before I start a career, i just like to take one summer off. And I made an, um, a, I found a commercial fishing boat in Prince William Sound that needed a crew, and I decided I would go and crew for the summer. And that summer became 28 years. Um, so I fell in love with commercial fishing. I fell in love with Alaska, with the sound, with the kind of a can-do attitude. Um, and I, it, what mattered in Cordova was how many fish you could catch. The second year in 1986, I bought my own boat and permit with a partner. And I didn't even mention my PhD, my master's, nothing. I mean, it mattered about fishing. Um, and by 1987, 
there wasn't like this eminent feeling like I was going to about to die every time we went out fishing. Um, and I felt like I should pay back our good fortune from the sea. I went into the Cordova District Fishermen United office and asked what I could do to help. And they didn't know me for other than a fisherwoman. So they just invited me to sit down and pay attention and see what would interest me. And, you know, halfway through the meeting, all these guys, uh, Alieska came up. And I went, oh, maybe I can help with that. And I had no idea that all these guys were the ones that had sued um, the first National Environmental Policy Act lawsuit to try to keep the pipeline terminus out of Prince William Sound and that they had won this lawsuit all the way, they'd taken it all the way to the Supreme Court, it stuck with it. And, um, and then of course, Vice President Spiro Agnew broke the, broke the Senate vote and we got the pipeline. But these were the same guys. And so then I, I got defensive and I said, whoa, I do have a master's and a doctorate in oil pollution. And they were like, oh, 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 well, here. They voted me onto the board just like that and uh, said the Alieska case is yours. And that was 87. So I was actually working chronic oil pollution issues um, before the oil spill. And I had testified at this Congress and testified at the state and was active. I was on the board of United Fishermen of Alaska. Um, and it all came to the night before the oil spill in Prince William Sound when the community of Valdez asked me to give a talk to Valdez on the downsides of oil, uh, being the neighbor, um, you know, the most immediate neighbor to the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And the only reason I got to give that talk was because Mike Williams with Alaska was off at the party at, Al at the terminal celebrating a billion barrels of oil shipped safely through Prince William Sound. So as I was giving my talk warning it's not a matter of if but when there's a big spill, the Exxon Valdez was being loaded and it was pulling away from the dock. And by the time I got back to my um, cabin three hours later, the Exxon Valdez was on the rocks. And I got the knock on the door at 7 o'clock in the morning that we've had the big one. And I will never forget that jolt of adrenaline. Um, and all these ideas is what we needed to do. Um, and I, I think I'll just say that I was the second plane out on the Exxon Valdez. And I still remember just this surreal feeling of this beautiful sound, beautiful sunrise, pink you know, mountains all glowing, and um, here's this tanker just with this amoeba of oil. And um, I knew that it didn't say, stay uh, calm very long in Prince William Sound in March, and it would just be a matter of time. And I knew from my academic training what would happen, or most likely what would happen to the biology, to the ecosystem. Um, and I remember thinking, this is too big. For one person, this is too much. This is all going to be ruined. I should just leave right now uh, and sell my fishing permit and get out. And then I remember thinking, wait a minute. I know enough to make a difference. Do I care enough? And I think that's why you're all here and why Barrow, even though they haven't had a big spill yet, and the other communities that haven't is, you can, you can kind of see beyond tomorrow. You can see that it's, if, it, if things are going to change, it's because of people like us that care. Um, care before the disaster happens, has the, have the imagination to realize that this could happen in my backyard, and have the courage to step up and say, well, I better learn what I can do now um, um, to either prevent something like this or in hindsight, to make it to better so that this maybe won't happen again or we'll be more prepared. Um, and I, so basically 20 years shot by and um, what I really learned was how much it hurt a community. Um, I will say that I went down, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a little playing with time here back and forth, but just to say that um, when the fish runs collapsed in 1993, pink salmon and herring, um, the fishermen and the native people said, hey, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. All those bays that trap the oil, 
That's where all the young of the year, those are the nurseries grounds for the young of the year. What do you think is going to happen to the little eggs, to the little fish? The fishermen and the native people all said, we have to wait. We have to wait to see if the fish survive and grow up to be adults, if those adults can produce offspring that live as opposed to die. So we all knew that there was going to be like this hiatus of literally four years. People had it pegged, four years. We had to wait four years before we called it all clear. And what happened four years later? Wham. <laughs> Definitely not an all clear. It was like all disaster. So the killing did not stop in 1989, the year of the spill. And that's one thing that the scientists who came in, their understanding at the time was, was not that. Their understanding was that there would be a rapid recovery and um, things would be back to normal. And that is just not what happened. And this, there was a, well, I guess you had discussed the, the science angle that oil is a thousand more times toxic than we thought in the 1970s. Um, 20 years after the Exxon Valdez, we knew that the papers were coming out. Zero public policy has changed to accommodate that the laws need to change to better protect the environment. Zero, all right? So um, meanwhile, there's the problem of if it was sick for the, made the wildlife sick, people aren't that much different from marine mammals and what did it do to the people? And I had focused on the, the ecosystem, but I kept hearing all these stories of my friends who came in from, from the oil spill uh, response to shift over to commercial fishing. They are sick, they have these rashes, they have these headaches, dizziness, uh, cold and flu-like symptoms. Ricky, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I'm like, I'm a marine toxicologist, not a doctor. Surely the doctors will take care of this. I didn't know that the medical science was not advanced at that point either. Um, and ultimately, 13 years after the Exxon Valdez, I teamed up with Alaska Community Action on Toxics, who some of you might know, and I really um, uh, support and I'm very respectful of the work that they do, Pam Miller and company. Um, and we teamed up and we sort of went, did an investigation 13 years later to figure out were there, what were the ties, what were the dots that we could connect. And we found court records. I went down to Dallas and talked to the doctor down there that had treated people uh, who came down from um, Alaska. There weren't very many chemical illness treatment centers, chemical detox centers, not from, from alcohol, but, but from chronic pollution in your environment problems. Uh, breathing polluted air, drinking contaminated water, the stuff that kind of sticks in you. So the fishermen, a lot of the, uh, maybe a couple dozen of the uh, oil spill cleanup workers had, had found their way to this clinic in Dallas. And I went down there and interviewed the doctor and he was like, look, if you have sick people and you have sick wildlife and they're sick because of the same chemical, that's the strongest evidence you have that that chemical is a problem. And I'm like, but it's oil. And he said, so? And this was Dr. Ray at Environmental Health Clinic in Dallas. And I realized, oh my God, I have to take on the whole oil industry, not just Exxon, because at that point I was contemplating writing my first book, which became Sound Truth and Corporate Myths. So part one of that is oil effects on people. Part two is oil effects on animals. Part three is what policies do we need to change now that we know that oil is more toxic? So, um, and unfortunately, the symptoms for chemical illness uh, from oil exposure uh, resemble very normal symptoms, cold and flu-like symptoms, dizziness, headaches, nausea. Those are central nervous system problems, um, skin uh, rashes, um, um, blood disorders. Okay, that freaked people out a little bit when they were like, vomiting blood or peeing blood. Um, but what people essentially did was they normalized the abnormal. They said, oh, you know, I've got the Valdez crud. I've got this high paying cleanup job. I'll get better once I go home. Well, that didn't happen. Somebody told me in, uh, in um, 2001, I thought I had the Valdez crud in 1989. I didn't think I would have it for 13 years. And unfortunately, that's the problem. Um, that repeated during the BP disaster. So I just uh, want to summarize and say, 
the field, this is the second paradigm shift, if you will, um, after Exxon Valdez. Yes, oil is a thousand times more toxic to wildlife. A paradigm shift is when scientists understand the world one way, like, oh, the world is flat. And then somebody will disprove that theory, like Columbus sailed around it. Oh, the world is round. So science adjusts. So when I talk about a paradigm shift, what I'm really talking about is scientists understanding completely changed of the way they thought things were. So, okay, wildlife's more to uh, oil's more toxic to wildlife. It's these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, this black stuff that stays on the beaches, that gets inside bodies and jams cell function, reproductive function, uh, respiratory pro uh, function, DNA coding, um, immune system suppression. Um, uh, it's a systemic poison. That is how the medical community now recognizes oil, ordinary oil, all right? Before we even put dispersants on it, oil is a systemic poison. So then there's the problem, which I'm sure you've discussed, there are all these, met, um, it hurts. Communities fall apart during an oil disaster. During a um, natural disaster, communities pull together, put out the fire, put out the earthquake, um, or not put out the earthquake, respond to the earthquake, help people who've lost their homes, find people, uh, build the sandbags for a flood. P people pull together and work together. But in a um, man-made disaster, there's a spiller, there's a money flying around, somebody gets paid, somebody doesn't, maybe your brothers, and it, it, it just goes like this. Maybe your best friends, you know, you have identical boats, and somebody's getting paid three times as much as you, man. Things just fly apart. So when I went down to the BP, oh, uh, so let me describe this. So we were in court for 20 years fighting Exxon, who had said four years after the, days, four days after the spill, Exxon showed up in Cordova and said, we will make you whole. No lawsuit has ever taken 20 years. Bring us your damages, show us how we can compensate you, we will make you whole. And we were dumb enough to believe them. Um, and it turned out in our 20 year lawsuit that subsistence culture, subsistence harvesting um, didn't even factor in to the legal system because you had to be able to put a dollar amount on what you lost. And in a subsistence culture, you cannot do that because it's priceless, this ability to do what you've done for time memorial. And the native community in collectively in Prince William Sound started joking about a buck a duck because they actually had to say, well, the judge could understand it as if this duck that you caught wild, you harvested subsistence, was actually a chicken in a grocery store, that chicken would be worth $8. So that duck is worth $8. Really? So what are they gonna do with whales? Go and figure out what a hamburger costs and price your whale at the cost of a hamburger? The legal system, it, it, it's like subsistence is a square and you're trying to put it in a round hole. It just doesn't fit, okay? So um, ultimately the legal system let us all down um, and gave us 10 cents on the dollar. Our award got cut to 10 cents on the dollar. So the money that we were hoping we could use to pay for fishery losses that are still ongoing to this day, like herring, mm -mm. I had friends who went bankrupt 20 years afterward. Um, but the point is, a year after that, the BP well blew in the Gulf. And I was like, oh man, all those people down there are gonna make the same mistake we made in Alaska BP is going to say, we will make you whole. Sounds great. Ah. And I went, they're all going to make the same mistake unless somebody goes and coaches. And then I was like, oh, that would be me. So I went down to the Gulf intending to stay a year. Does this sound a little familiar? I ended up staying, I mean, I intended to stay a month. It was so hot. Um, and I ended up staying a year. Um, and I will share another quick personal story, which is, I mean, I didn't know a soul in the Gulf. This is not, this is not, you know, it's hot, I stayed away. Um, so here I am, I went down to Venice um, 
with my assistant, Lisa Marie, who had also been through the Exxon Valdez, and she, she says, what's the plan? I said, there's no plan. We're just going to where the fishermen are. They're staging the in-situ burn out of Venice. That's where we're going to find the fishermen right now. So let's go where the fishermen are. I'm signing in at the hotel. The lady behind is looking as I'm signing in upside down. She says, Alaska? What are you doing here from Alaska? And I look at her, and I did some really quick thinking, and I was like, I'm a fisherman, and I survived the Exxon Valdez oil spill. That's all I said. And she looks at me, and she says, I'm a fisherman. And she's got really nice coffered hair and fingernails and makeup, and I'm thinking, huh, maybe the fisherwomen look different in the Gulf than they do in Alaska. And I said, and she says, why are you here? And I said, I'm here to talk to fishermen. And she said, when? I said, this afternoon would be nice. And she turned around and she got on that phone. And four and a half hours later, I was talking to 50 commercial fisher w wives mostly because the guys were out doing the in-situ burn. And I got around to, to that promise, we will make you whole. And I said, we fell for that in Alaska. And so now I'm going to ask you something. And I just started looking at one woman after another and I said, how much is your marriage worth? Because marriage is busted up left and right after this. How much is your husband's life worth? Or your son's life who was going to be a commercial fisherman? Because they committed suicide. How much is it not to have your husband beat you? Because the domestic violence went like this. How much is, is it worth to you not to have your family drinking and alcohol? Because that all skyrocketed with domestic. Next thing I know, women are like crying right? And they're tough. They're like Alaska. This is not what the Cajuns do. And people were like wiping their eyes and going, what do we need to do? Right? And I, I had my book Sound Truth and I was, they would describe that their husbands were like same exact respiratory problems from Prince William Sound. And I opened my book and I read like two sentences that describe the exact respiratory problems. And these people just looked at me and they go, what do we need to do? And I said, we need to get them respirators. Because, of course, in Alaska, we use respirators. And so I thought that would be a given in the Gulf. But no, 21 years different between the BP disaster uh, and the Exxon Valdez is the increased militarization of America. And I thought the Exxon Valdez was bad. It was a, a cakewalk compared to what happened in the Gulf of Mexico and the coastal communities there. There were cops in uniform that were off duty working for BP. You couldn't tell if you were talking to BP or a, a, a cop. They all looked the same and they were all giving orders the same. The Coast Guard, I had uh, Clint Guidry with the Louisiana Shrimp Association actually send me a photo of the Coast Guard boat going like this. On Clint's boat, Louisiana Shrimp Association, was the governor of Louisiana. They were trying to gain access to part of, of the spill area. And a Coast Guard boat came by and said, no, you don't have authority to go there. And the governor said, excuse me, I'm the governor of this state. And this is a public waterway. And the Coast Guard said, these are BP's orders, not ours. That's what's gone down in America, okay, at this point. This is way, way worse. So um, the third paradigm shift was this, uh, the emotional impacts. And that's my second book on the Exxon Valdez was Not One Drop. Whoever I'm waving. Okay. Um, and really the fourth um, and last shift is what, kind of where we're at now in, um, in Alaska and nationally with oil spill prevention and response. And we are going down a very bad road right now. I actually think that as a nation, we are in worse shape than we were 25 years ago in terms of oil spill containment and recovery because we have let the oil industry use the research and development funds promised to it through the Oil Pollution Act to come up with better stuff for oil spill response, they focused all that on dispersants. And the science coming out of the Gulf now, now we're talking almost four years from the Gulf of Mexico, is showing that 
you take this person. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say that in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, boy, it was bad. Uh, the boy, uh, over two million gallons of these corexit dispersants that were used experimentally in Prince William Sound were napalmed on the Gulf. Napalmed, and when you sprayed it like this on the water surface, it was so hot down there. The water surface comes up into the air every day forms these clouds, these clouds go ashore, the rain comes down. I was getting calls from people 150 miles inland after a rainstorm. My skin is itching. I have a rash. Just exact same symptoms of people on the coast. I mean, this stuff moves into the ecosystem, into the ocean, into the air. And what's coming out of the Gulf now are stories, not stories, actually science studies showing that the oil plus dispersant combined is actually far, far worse than the oil alone. The dispersants are an industrial solvent that acted to pull the oil into bodies. It acted like an oil delivery mechanism. So tunas, coral, bacteria, dolphins, all the way up. Um, there's just a new, like it's less than two weeks out, uh, study that came out on tuna that shows a, a, a juvenile tuna embryo, actually, heart beating, and it shows it in control conditions, and it shows it with oil and dispersant combined, and it stops. It's arrhythmia. And of course, in the Gulf, it's tuna is their big fish, right? As a po Well, huh, that's not a pun, but uh, um, and salmon up, up in Alaska. But um, it wasn't just the wildlife, it was people as well. There are, ten, there, there are tens of thousands of people who are sick in the Gulf. And the, if you want to get some of this, you should look at um, whistleblower.org. You could just Google Government Accountability Project. And they've taken like 25 affidavits of people who are sick and throwing up now and 100% disabled from breathing the air in 2010. That's how bad this stuff is. And what does the um, Alaska um, Regional Response Team want to do? They want to pre-authorize dispersant use in Alaska. There are no, RCAC, the Prince William Sound, ugh, Regional Citizen, thank you, um, Advisory uh, Council has been tracking dispersants and have done studies on dispersants Dispersants do not work in cold water marine environments. There is absolutely no need to use them. The industry right now is using dispersants as a green light rubber stamp to get the federal government and the state to approve their contingency plans just so they can go ahead and drill, just so the oil industry can go ahead with business as usual. We have got to ban these things. So um, that's sort of the fourth paradigm is that I actually finally started reading the national contingency plan and realized, oh my God, it's horrible. So uh, it does not, uh, think of what we're shipping across the lower 48, but not only, there's frack oil up in Alaska as well. Um, the contingency plan was uh, designed in 1968, 30 years before these tar sands oils and these Bakken shale oils started being transported and flowing through the U.S. Um, no way does the contingency plan deal with oil that sinks, like tar sands oil, and is mixed with uh, diluents. No way does it deal with this oil, the frac oil that explodes. No way. So um, I guess I'll just I'll just do some questions, maybe. I don't know. How do you want to do it? I mean, I, uh, oh, so Ricky R I K I Ott ott.com. I have a website. The oil, a lot of the oil spill stuff is up on there, including the counter proposal that we wrote for this plan to pre-authorize dispersants. We just said, no, forget it. Um, so anyway, um, there you have it. And thank, you know, I, I, I know this was an intensely personal experience to everyone. And I was really reluctant to try to write a book, much less two, um, on the Exxon Valdez oil spill. But it was the community of Cordova that asked me to write. 
And the first one, Sound Truth, I interviewed like 60 people. It's really not my story um, because I didn't feel like the oil spill was my story. But in not one drop, I found my voice. And that, that book is actually, um, it's, a, it's more talk, story talk. Um, and it's being used from eighth grade through university. There's a couple of films out now, Black Wave and Dirty, Black Wave is on Exxon Valdez, Dirty Energy on the BP disaster. I mean, <laughs> you would think you were back in Alaska again 21 years later, just hearing all the same stuff. So, all right, thank you all. Ricky, if you don't mind, this is Rosanna in Soldovia, and I think um, that I would uh, like to open it for questions if you'd be able and willing to answer questions of the, uh, from the audience. Absolutely. And I don't know if there's anybody else here in Anchorage that would like to talk as well, but anyway. Steve? So I, I, questions was fine. Sure. Um, let's go with the questions. And here in Soldovia, we do see uh, some of our own Soldovians in the back. In particular, people are pointing out uh, Steve Lewis in case he wants to say anything. We'd love to hear from you too, Steve. Uh, but at this um, point, let's see if anybody in Soldovia has got questions for Ricky. Yeah, we do have one. Um, let's see. I, I, I was curious, uh, what uh, Ricky, what your, what, what do you think is the best way to engage community responders in this kind of situation? Like, if, if you were, you know, if you were running Pico or whatever, uh, you know, how, how how do you how do you because it, I mean, it seems like uh, I mean, there's obviously the practicalities of actually cleaning up the oil, but a lot of these impacts that we've heard about tonight are, are also very emotional, and I mean, it seems like the value both in mobilizing this workforce and in terms of, of giving people a sense that they can help uh, 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 improve the situation. It, there's a huge value in engaging uh, communities in, in response. But on the other hand, there are all these health impacts. There are, you know, there are responses that may not be effective uh, and may put people at risk. You know, I, so I, I wonder what your thought is on, on how, how do we engage communities if something like this happens? Okay, so actually this is a proposal that I'm working on right now called ALERT, a locally empowered response team. And I'm doing this, trying to do this in different regions of the country, uh, after the fact in the Gulf, before the fact along the Keystone Corridor, um, to raise people's awareness. So this is a great question. Um, and part of it involves what I ran into in the Gulf. Um, I... People ask me, how do I, you know, I'm sick. How do I prove that I'm sick because of what I'm breathing? And I realized that people just didn't understand this um, chemical illness. So, um, and unfortunately, I only explained it, uh, I, I focused on community events. I, so I explained this to people. So people then would believe me, they'd take the blood tests, they'd go into their medical doctors. Their medical doctors didn't have a clue how to do occupational and environmental medicine. That is a specialty field. So two things right off the bat. I'm developing, I'm either, I'm developing for the public and I'm working with medical doctors who are going to be developing an environment, an education model on what's called environmental medicine. So pollutants in the environment, and in this case, oil. What this looks like, so like the public module will you know, have a discussion of these ordinary symptoms that don't seem to go away, maybe it's not a cold. Maybe if you've taken your fifth round of antibiotics, it's not biological, it's chemical. Um, so there's a, I think there's a, um, I know the peer listening uh, program went through um, for mental health and behavioral problems, but there was really no equivalent for physical health problems. Well, physical, chemical illnesses. Um, so I think that part of it is a need to educate um, how to defend your own health, that yes, you need to respond. That's people, people want to respond. But you should be informed that you're going to need a respirator and where to get these respirators, because if you're volunteers, you're going to be getting them yourself, um, and that you should be wearing these things. Because this oil, the Have I Spirit oil spill in 2007 in South Korea, the University of South Korea found that just 
breathing the fumes from working on the beach was enough to cause DNA problems and changes in your DNA, for God's sake. So, so that's one, so that's two, actually, if you count the public education module and the training the doctors to be ready for this. Otherwise, your specialty person is in Detroit, Michigan. You know, that's too far away. You need doctors who are trained for the accidents that could happen and the exposures that could happen in your community. Um, another component of that is how do you do your own air quality and water quality sampling? Um, because EPA is dealing with laws that were established in the 1970s. Well, in the 1970s, the level that was thought to be safe was here. Now we know it's down here. Now people are getting sick below the level that's safe. So <laughs> those laws haven't changed. So what people need to do is like uh, the bucket brigade. You need to be ready to do your own air quality monitoring, your own water quality monitoring, and you should definitely be doing your own baseline uh, human health sampling to prove that your body before this disaster did not have, for example, 95 percentile oil in your blood like people have in the Gulf, including two-year-old children, up to 80-year-olds plus, of oil in their blood. They breathed this stuff, it went right into their bodies. But how do you prove it, you know? Will you, number one, hopefully wear a respirator so this won't happen, but the problem is, <laughs> the people all along the coast got sick because you're in it 24 seven. So even if you go work, then you come home, you're still breathing the same air. So there was you know, significant exposure problems to the point where I would actually hope during an oil spill response that people actually get evacuated. That's how bad this is, all right? Um, this is like hazardous substance. Don't think of oil anymore as the benign thing. This is hazardous substance. If you're gonna stay and be in it, you're potentially risking your health and your children's health because the children are smaller, they're lower to the ground, they're breathing these heavier oil molecules that, that don't float so high in the air. Uh, look what happened after the tar sand spill. I, I was in Michigan after the tar sand spill with Enbridge. I was in Arkansas after the tar sand spill with Exxon, the Pegasus. Exxon only evacuated, for example, in Arkansas the immediate neighborhood where the oil rolled down the street. Well, not the neighbors on the other side of those on this street, you know? So not the school that was five blocks away. All the kids are starting to throw up, which is what they did in Michigan, right on the river, on the Kalamazoo River. And the school, EPA and came and tested the air up here somewhere. The kids are sitting here, they're breathing this air. Kids got sick, no explanation for it. So you got to be prepared to defend yourselves, okay? Um, and then beyond all that, then you can talk about oil spill response. So I think part of what will get people excited uh, and, and excited in terms of, whoa, maybe we, we want to either A, want to respond to this, or B, want to get out of here, um, is... You know, I think it's critical to learn about environmental medicine, get this education module in, get the doctor training going, um, prepare yourselves. Where are all your respirators? Do you have a stockpile of respirators in your community? Um, and then we just... I think we need conics as a boom, and all the fishermen need to... I think... Hi, my name is Dorinda, and I worked on the Exxon Valdez oil spill from the beginning to the end. I was in charge of the bioremediation. I um, own property in Anchor Point, and the Buchanan is drilling seven miles north of me. We haven't built our new home. This is my husband, Steve Brezina, retired Air Force. And my concern from Anchor Point to Saldovia is that we don't have conixes with booms. I know how to drive a boat. I fish Prince William Sound, and it was devastating. I cry. You know, Stan Stevens did a very good job at giving us a baseline on our books of what lives. And in Saldovia, 
at low tide at 29 feet, it will take less than 25 minutes from the Buchanan accident to hit you within less than a half an hour. Do you have a conix with boom? Do you have fishermen that will go out there with respirators in the storm with buoys to anchor down and prevent the oil from hitting your shores? And when you come home with oil, can you take that gear off and have another $1,500 gear to put on and get back out there to make sure the booms don't break until you get more help? That's miles. I have taken maps and I have, I have taken my wheel and I have you know, thought about how many minutes it's gonna take to hit because I was on the DB100. I was on the, on the largest oil rig, the largest political boat. I was there morning and evening. I lived in Valdez for many, many years since I was 18 and lucky Cordova's fishermen got together and saved their waters. Take the experiences from the Cordova fishermen, get as many young people together and make sure you have conics full of diapers, boom, respirators, extra heli Hansons, you know, response, EMT one, two, and three ready to go. Because once you get hit, it will be there forever. Thank you. We're full of cheer, cheery news here. <laughs> um, good evening. My name is Steve Lewis. I'm representing the uh, city of Seldovia on the board of directors of Prince William Sound RCAC, have done so for about 15 years. But I've also um, some involvement, had some involvement in the BP spill. I was on the uh, President's Commission for uh, the investigation of the spill. And I also worked for the uh, Department of Justice on post-spill uh, litigation <clears throat> for a little bit. And what I would like to comment on is where we are socially and politically. Um, and in that regard, I would agree that we're in worse shape than we were 25 years ago. The power of the corporate structures are incredibly large compared to our power as individuals. Um, we've seen what the Supreme Court thinks about the personhood, personhood of corporations. That's the most dangerous thing that's happened in a long time, in my personal opinion. I'm not expressing the city of Seldovia's opinion or the opinion of the Prince William Sound RCAC. But what we do have is the power of us as a group and our voice. As was mentioned by Dr. Ott, Nothing has been put in place following the recommendations of the President's Commission. There's been no change in legislation. There's been, in fact, a, to my mind, regression in the attitude towards spill response and spill liability in terms of this focus on dispersants, um, in terms of the focus on, oh, we now have technology that allows us to maybe not be dependent upon importing, but maybe we can actually export and make a whole bunch of money by doing it. Um, we've got our priorities backwards. As I said, though, what we have is power as a group. What you have to do, though, as a group to exercise that power is to convince your elected legislators that they need to change what they're doing. That's an extremely difficult thing for us to do. I don't know how we do that exactly, or I'd be out there doing it. The only example I can give is that I've seen a little exercise in local mobilization recently in the legislature in Juneau um, concerning funding for the Ketchmack Bay Research Reserve. There was a sudden, very vocal input from the public 
from agencies and to a certain extent from a few industry groups concerning the proposed cut in funding for that group. And lo and behold, the legislators realized that this was something that was important to their constituents and that maybe they should try to do something about it. And they are making efforts that way. It's not solved, but it looks like it might be. My point of bringing this up as an example is that's one small case of the public speaking together as a group directly to the legislators. And that's where you've got to go, I think, is directly to the legislators. Um, you've got to come to them with a voice that's united. You've got to come to them with a voice that's technically sound. And you've got to come to them with a voice that carries personal conviction of your group. Those, those are just my personal thoughts on it. I, like I said, I'm outside of being directly involved with it. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how you get everybody together to move this sort of thing forward. The, the people who we elect and send to make our laws and make sure that our laws are enforced need to understand that we're the ones that count, not the business end, not the industry. And that, I'll let it go at that. Thanks. Thank you, Steve and Dorinda and Dr. Ott. Is there anyone uh, else in the Anchorage site that uh, would like uh, to speak? Not yet. I, I would, no. Okay. I would like to see. Uh, do any of the other sites have questions for Dorinda or Dr. Ott or Steve or anyone else? Uh, do we have questions from Kotzebue? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I have a comment and a question. You know, we're along the uh, Chukchi Sea Coast here, and uh, there is impending uh, exploration that's going to happen here with Shell Oil and ConocoPhillips. Um, and I just wondered what Dr. Ott um, thought about this and, and anything that we might be able to do to make it safer um, for all of our communities, really, really remote. I don't even know if you can say the word remote. We're way more remote than remote. We're just little dots along this coast with a few thousand people. Um, how do we prepare for this onslaught and this impending disaster? <laughs> well, um, <sighs> I mean, I wish I had a really good answer. Um, I've taken these two trips across the North Slope. Um, I know what remote means when you say remote. Um, and I just see impending disaster when I look at this clash of cultures. Um, and I, uh, the best I could offer in on the North Slope was uh, came out of Point Hope actually um, was offering that in the Lower 48 um, and in other countries the children are being trained to think about, um, I don't even want to call them alternatives, I want to call them energy options, because they are energy options. Um, the, um, what would work up here are the, ty the, heat, the ocean pumps, the heat differential pumps, um, wind in certain areas, certainly sun in the summer. There's, I think that we're, if we keep training the children to think that it's only oil, we're, we're doing a disservice to the children. Um, and the Point Hope uh, folks started, and, the, and actually some of the folks in Barrow too, started saying, yeah, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, why aren't we talking about some of these other options? Why aren't we giving our children options? This is our youth. They need to know these things. So... Um, um, Let's see. 
There are, are also, there's also a group called Our Children's Trust that I'm just, I've been working with very loosely last year. I'm starting to tighten up that relationship this year um, where they uh, are working with the top scientists, the top lawyers um, in the country that are, are aware of the climate crisis and are trying to stop it and falling on deaf ears in Washington, D.C. And they've turned to, um, like Steve said, working together, find your, find your groups that are pulling together. They have got children in all 50 states. When I say children, I mean under 18 years of age that are filing petitions, filing lawsuits, that the policies coming from Washington, D.C. are a breach of public trust responsibilities for protecting the water, protecting the climate for future generations. Um, the, um, I've just been to a series of law uh, university um, uh, symposiums, young youth leadership coming out of the lawyers, coming out of the scientists, up and coming scientists, lawyers, going to try this angle. Um, stall. Stalling is our best effort right now because um, by all intents and purposes, it looks like uh, <laughs> the climate scientists are coming in uh, too low on their expectations of how fast this climate uh, sort of crisis is going to hit us. Um, and if the oil industry thinks that they can do business in a state of climate collapse, you know, they're going to find they're sorely mistaken. So um, banning dispersants would be a good idea because that will force the oil industry to realize they really have no contingency plan. That's one of the reasons I'm so adamant about dispersants. It's a, it's a, it's subterfuge. It's smoke and mirrors. They do not work in Alaska. So you do not have a viable contingency plan. If it contains, we will use dispersants. Um, so, I mean, I'm trying to scramble to come up with some legal angles that aren't so, that haven't been tried yet. Um, I have a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I have a and couple then, angles. Okay, and then to let you know, we're, we do have a question about it in Seldovia too, so let's um, oh, okay. hear from you, Dorinda, please. So, some of the legal angles is that most of the contingency plans for oil spills has to have a container for education, for EMTs, for people who um, know how to medically treat each other, etc. But when you need to have diapers and booms and a medical team trained within your community, and that will be paid by the oil companies. The reason why I know this is because I used to work for Alyeska. I used to work for Exxon. I was on the other side until the Valdez oil spill. I, out of 64,000 people, I was the only one, maybe one of six, wearing respirators 24-7 because I was smart. I did a pre-blood test and I measured my blood work before I went out on the first year of the oil spill and every year after. I medically trained, I went to nursing school, so I know how to clean my liver, how to clean my organs. You know, before Mr. and Mrs. Thompson died on that plane crash with Cheryl, Cheryl was my friend in Valdez, and we talked about how to help with the people and the natives, you know, um, Chuck Totemoff is the chief of uh, Chaniga and the Tatitlik village people, and I was the first one to come to the chief and tell him what I saw out on the boats and to have them prepare. And it got worse, and it got worse. And the oil companies give every man, woman, and child a million dollars. But is a million dollars enough for the future of the village, of the children, of their health? Majority of the elders now are past. I'm Filipino, Spanish, Hawaiian, and Chinese, born and raised in Hawaii. I'm one of the Royal Hawaiian Healers. Governor Lingle has awarded me medals for carrying on my grandmother's way of healing. So I have spent more of my life in Alaska of fishing and hunting and homesteading. And what I say to you is sometimes stalling is good, but that oil spill, that disbursement in the air, 
you have to get educated and you need to do it immediately. Whether it be an ice jam in the river, whether it be an earthquake, whether it be an oil spill, there are certain medicines out in this spring, summer that you can harvest. And if you know how to harvest medicine, prepare. Whether it be gathering salt, making more dried fish, you know, curing the moose, having your stash of food because it's coming. We don't know what's going on with our binary star system, but if we should have another earthquake, what is it going to do to the oil pipeline? Say the oil pipeline breaks and it burns. It's going to be in our air and we're going to breathe it. Prepare yourselves and get educated. Even if you can't go to nursing school, at least have an EMT one. Have everybody certified with first aid so you can help each other. And this season, come spring, as a master gardener for the state of Alaska, harvest medicine. I have been saving willow seeds. I have been saving rhubarb. I have been harvesting medicine from, from last year's rose hips. The most simplest things, because in time of need, we need clean water and you need medicine because nobody will come to your aid. L look what happened to the ice jams this past winter, how many months it took them. I even had my husband from the Air Force knock on the door for Coast Guard. Are you gonna go help the people? It took six weeks. That's politics. Prepare. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we have another question here in Soldovia. I, I had a comment, actually. I happen to be in Point Lay, uh, uh, which might be more remote than Patsview, when Stat Oil, the, the Norwegian um, uh, state of oil company, was presenting about their their plans offshore. Um, and, um, and the community spoke out uh, uh, quite passionately about oil spill risk. And uh, um, I, I was impressed at you know, how, how, how much they, they put into that. But I was surprised that there was no mention at all of uh, climate implications of, of uh, developing oil there. And, um, uh, and and this was near the end of a coastal survey I was doing where we, we flew all the way from the Canadian border eventually to Point Hope. Um, and just, I, I mean, being someone who's fairly familiar with, with, uh, with some climate change impacts and so on, having been up there a little bit, I was blown away at what I saw. It's the, the, the landscape's changing so quickly there. And uh, I mean, it's oil in the ground. It's I mean, if we want to find a way to sequester carbon, I mean, this stuff is already sequestered. So um, uh, I think that that should be part of the conversation, in my opinion. Thank you. Brent. I just want to add. Could I just add really quickly that um, I'm actually going to be in Homer, uh, well, tomorrow and um, Wednesday, and I'm giving a pre-screening of a film called Pretty Slick at the Pratt Museum. Um, 7 o'clock to, I think, 9 o'clock. The doors will open at 6.30. I'll be there, of course. So um, I hope to see some of you folks um, there. It's The Pretty Slick is about the story of dispersants from the BP disaster. 70 minutes, and then we'll have a discussion afterward. OK, and to recap, that was tomorrow in Homer. Uh, what was the time again, Ricky? The, I'll be in Homer tomorrow, but Pretty Slick is screening on Wednesday. Um, at the Pratt Museum, 7 to 9 p.m., and it's going to screen, sorry, everybody, thir uh, Thursday in Anchorage at the UAA uh, Student Union. Um, I, th I think that's 6.30 to 8.30 in Anchorage on Thursday, Homer Pratt Museum on Wednesday. Thank you. And we do. <laughs> oh, well, they were asking if there could be a copy made or sent or... Uh, um, it can be as soon as it's released. It hasn't been released yet, and the film producer is very nervous that I'm running around with a copy of his film. So um, <laughs> I'll get it to you all as soon as I can. Okay, thank you. And I know in Soldovia we have another question, but I do feel bad that I haven't checked with Craig or with Beryl lately. Uh, and just want to make sure, do either of you have questions, comments that you'd like to add or ask of anyone? Okay, then we do have another question here in Soldovia from Sarah Baxter. Part of my time on the oil spill, I worked as an EMT. And if I had been faced with 
an oil exposure victim, I would not have had a clue what to do about it. And there is nothing in our curriculum or in our text that deals with oil exposure. And we need to address that. We need to get it included in our curriculum for the EMTs and ETTs. And the only way to do that is if a lot of people start contacting a state training officer and bringing that up because uh, one community ain't going to do it. But if we get, uh, you know, a little bit of a little bit of input, I think we could get that included. I, I think our our state people are responsive enough that we could do that. Thanks. Really good. Great. Yeah, that's great. Yay. And we do have another question. Uh, this is from Camille Turner. Do I have to go up there? You don't have to. Oh, I just wanted the name again um, of the group. Can she hear me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the yes. group yes. of uh, the young people that were working together and trying to contact the legislators. Our Children's yeah. Trust. And actually, there was a one of the early filers was from Nome, I think. It was a UPIC young man. Um, but anyway, uh, they've got a great website, and they constantly need children. And the, the beauty of having children means that you have to be in the schools teaching them, and that's another thing that should be done. I mean, not only modules for EMTs, but modules for children, too. Um, so um, try to get those as soon as possible. Thank you. And I do, I see we lost a couple of sites. I do want to point out before anyone from uh, Barrel goes, we're running a little over. Um, the OWL network, the Online with Libraries network uh, that all of your libraries participate in is hosting for the next two Saturdays two video teleconferences on dispersants. The first is uh, called Chemically Enhanced Dispersion. These will be um, um, moderated by the University of New Hampshire. They will occur on Saturday from 2 to 3.30, this Saturday. And the following Saturday, that one is titled Effects of Dispersants in Oil. Um, and uh, you can attend those simply by asking your librarian to, to sign your library up for those conferences and learn a little bit more ab about dispersants, a little more than what we discussed tonight. Now, I have a question. Um, this field is incredibly polarized, and anybody who's sponsored by oil money is going to say that dispersants are the best thing since peanut butter and jelly. Um, anybody who's been through one of these disasters and who, or who, uh, I'm talking about res ordinary residents uh, in counting, um, is going to say this is horrible. Uh, so who exactly, where could we find out who is uh, going to be actually speaking at this, at these? Uh, this is actually being presented by the Coastal Response Research Center um, for someone who's at the University of New Hampshire. I can find a name for you if you'd like. I'll check it out. I just want to add that on the OWL archive site, and Rose can help get you together with that, there are two video conferences already archived um, that come out of New Hampshire on oil and dispersants. So even so, before the upcoming ones, you can catch up and find out perhaps a little bit more about who the presenter is. Okay, great. Thanks. And, and if Barrow anything, is one of the sites that's planning to participate for those of you in Barrow, that Barrow is already scheduled to be watching us. Okay. And then I was okay. going to say, if anything, um, and you don't like the way that you're presenting, you can take the knowledge that you got here tonight. And um, will you please uh, challenge? That would be my challenge to you. Um, and we'll see how that goes. Um, this has been a phenomenal evening. Um, grateful to every site for your participation. Grateful to the numerous Saldovians and oil responders who showed up uh, tonight. And um, I just want to extend a very heartfelt thank you to all of you, Dr. Ott, the Lewises, um, Dorinda, and your husband, everyone in Barrow who showed up, the Craig Library. Bear, um, Homer didn't make it, but they tried. And um, once again, the crowd in Soldovia, I uh, thank you.
we're about 10 minutes past our time. So unless there is uh, any other comments, I would like to, uh, we do have one last comment here from Walt Sonnen. <laughs> yeah, um, just in a nutshell, I, this has been a wonderful evening and, and thank you, Ricky. This has been wonderful and I will see you on Wednesday. Um, Great. Great. And the, uh, I read this in the last week. I don't know who to credit it to, but um, just one sentence. The root of the problem is dependency on oil and corporate control. And if we could take those, that statement from here and think about it, um, I think it would be meaningful. Thank you very much.